Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video, we're going to take a gander at the disappearance of a man by the name of Zeb Quinn. He vanished on January 2nd, 2000, while on his way to buy a new car. And that was it, he just vanished. And the case went cold for quite a long time. 15 years to be exact, and then the story took an even darker turn. Alright, let's giddy up and get into the case of Zeb Quinn. Zeb Quinn was born on May 12th, 1981, near Asheville, North Carolina. His mother, Denise, described him as sweet, shy, and a little awkward. Zeb joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps in high school, and had a part-time job at the local Walmart's electronics department. He was known to be a very hard worker. 18-year-old Zeb was saving up hard to replace his old Mazda, and when a co-worker of his, Jason Robert Owens, told him about an eclipse in a nearby town, he offered to go check it out with Zeb. Could be a good purchase, could be affordable, get a new car. The two were seen just after about 9pm in the Walmart parking lot on January 2nd. They were getting into their own cars and were planning on driving separately over to a nearby town to check out this other car. Surveillance footage showed the two making a stop at a gas station at 9.15pm and purchasing sodas before returning to their cars and continuing down the road. Zeb was following Jason. A few minutes after leaving the gas station, Jason reported seeing Zeb flash his headlights, signalling him to pull over. Zeb had received a message on his pager and needed to find a phone to return the call. Jason suggested Zeb go back to the gas station and see if they had a payphone. Zeb told Jason to wait in his car for him on the side of the road and he would be back in a few minutes. Zeb then drove back to the gas station in search of a phone and returned 15 minutes later. Zeb got out of the car telling Jason they would settle up later but he had to go right then. Something came up. Jason said he was very frantic, extremely agitated. Zeb then drove off so frantic and uh, frazzled that he slammed his car into the back of Jason's. He then sped off into the night. No one knows what exactly the message was that Zeb received that just set him off and distressed him so much. And that was the last anyone ever saw of Zeb Quinn. Zeb's mother, worried when he wasn't responding to her pages like he always did, then began to call around asking if anyone knew where he was. She continued to page him on and off throughout the night with no response. Knowing how out of character this was for Zeb, she went to the police station the following afternoon and filed a missing persons report. Now, the police didn't really have anything to go on. No, no clues, no body, no car, no crime scene, no nothing. For about a day. That's how long it took for things to become suspicious. Well, as if, you know, receiving a message that incredibly distressed you, crashing your car, and then speeding off into the night, never to be seen again. You know, that's already suspicious enough, I guess. Clearly something was going on. Two days after Zeb disappeared, a call was placed to the Walmart Electronics Department by someone claiming to be Zeb, saying that, <coughs> I'm sick, I'm fucked, can't come into work for a few days, tummy ache. The employee who took the call knew immediately it wasn't Zeb. She worked with him, she knew what his voice sounded like. She then, like something out of a comedy film, star 69 it and heard, Hello, Volvo. The call was made from the local Volvo factory. Jason Owens also worked there. The police questioned him and Jason said Zeb asked him to make the call for him. Why Zeb himself wouldn't call? He told the police about going to look at the car and Zeb getting the page and then being panicked and speeding off. When police went to check Jason's story, they discovered that not only did he call out of work the day after Zeb's disappearance, but he was also claiming he was involved in a second car accident that night. Another accident after he had been rear-ended by Zeb. Right. Apparently, Jason went to the hospital 
the night of the 2nd, with a few broken ribs and a head injury. He claimed it was from a car accident. His truck had minimal damage and no accident report was made or insurance claim filed. Though Jason was considered a person of interest, he continued to deny any involvement in whatever happened to Zeb. Now police also learned of another person close to Zeb, a woman by the name of Misty Taylor. They met about a month prior, and according to Zeb's family and friends, he was mad about her. Misty, however, eh, not so much. She told police they were not in a relationship, and she had a boyfriend, Wesley Smith, and a baby. According to Zeb's family and friends, when Wesley found out about Zeb and Misty, he was pissed. But Zeb and Misty kept talking in secret. Then, two days before New Year's, which would be about four days before Zeb went missing, Misty cut off all communication. Worried about this, Zeb called to check on her, but forgot to block his number. He realized this, got scared, and hung up. Zeb told his family about this, and he also told them he was pretty worried. He was scared that Wesley might either beat the living shit out of him, or worse. So, that pager Zeb received, I wonder who it could be from. Well, the police record showed that it came from his mother's sister, his aunt, Ina Ustich. Now, Zeb was not close with her, like, at all. He rarely kept in contact with her, and when the police went to give her a little visit, she said she never did that. She never uh, messaged Zeb, she never paged him or whatever. She had no idea what they were on about. Bizarrely interesting. So police records showed that the page that Zeb got, it came from Ina, his aunt's house. But she said she wasn't even home that night. She was with, get this, Misty, Misty's mother who she was doing business with, and Wesley. Hmm, right. Ina then later filed a police report saying her house was broken into that night, but nothing was stolen. Just a few picture frames and other items were moved around. I don't know if everybody is just lying or what. And then, a few days after Zeb's disappearance, his car was finally found. And things get weirder. Zeb's car was discovered at the Little Pig's Barbecue restaurant, which happened to be just across the street from the hospital Zeb's mother worked at. The windows were cracked and the headlights were on. There were lips drawn on the back windshield with exclamation points in what looked like lipstick. A jacket that was not Zeb's, an unidentified hotel key, and a three-month-old, alive, black Labrador puppy. Of all things, a dog. The driver's seat was also pushed up, as if someone shorter than Zeb was driving the car. Zeb's mother said she believes the car was intentionally placed there by someone who knew where she worked, as if they intended for her to find it. And then, a week after the car was found, a couple said they saw someone driving that car around in downtown Asheville a couple of days before it was found. A sketch artist worked with them on a composite of the driver. The sketch looked a lot like Misty Taylor. Then months went by with no leads or clues in Zeb's disappearance. They found his car, a jacket, a hotel key, a dog, but no clues or leads on any of them. The puppy, however, was adopted by one of the detectives, so happy ending for him. But Zeb's case went cold. And that's true here in the mountains with the Zeb Quinn case. Twelve years ago, the teenager was last seen in Asheville after he left work. No, no new leads have developed for years in this case, but the teenager's mother is holding out hope that someday she'll have some answers. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Zeb and wonder where he is, what he would be doing now if he was still with us. Zeb's mother, Denise Vlahakis, has only pictures and memories of a son with a bright future, working at Walmart on Hendersonville Road. His mother has some hope he could have been kidnapped and is still alive. Since we've never found his body, there's, in the back of my mind, there's always the possibility. Um, in Zeb's case, I think that there's so so many other 
pieces of information that we have that lead more to the probability of foul play. But until, you know, I just, until you find, we find his body, um, in the back of my mind, there's always a, a little bit of hope. In March 2015, 15 years after Zeb disappeared, Christy Schoen Codd and her husband Joseph Codd disappeared. Christy had become somewhat of a public figure after appearing on season 8 of Food Network Star. Hi folks, I'm Christy Schoen, and I like to fish, I like to hunt, and man, I love to cook. I also like drinking beer with the best of them. But don't get me wrong. I'm just a red-blooded American girl who doesn't mind getting my hands dirty now and then. At the time of her disappearance, she was pregnant and dreamed of opening a cafe in Leicester, North Carolina, where her and her husband lived. There was no reason for her or her husband to abruptly leave town, without their cars of all things, and they stopped answering family members' calls. Something was very worrying. On March 16th, 2015, following a neighbor's tip, a man was arrested and the couple's family got heartbreaking news. Christy, Joseph and their unborn child Skylar were dead. The man they arrested was no other than Jason Owens, the last man that we know of to see Zeb Quinn. A neighbor had seen Jason carrying unusually large bags out of the trash, prompting the call to police. During an investigation of his home, the couple's remains were found in his stove, and Jason was arrested. At the time, Jason was a home contractor who'd worked for the couple and called Christy a good friend. He'd been having car trouble, and while the Cods were helping him with it, Jason accidentally hit the gas, running over them both. Out of fear he'd go to jail, he dismembered their bodies and burned them in his wood-burning stove. He then moved the couple's cars and pawned some of their belongings so it would look like a robbery. We were able to recover what we think are human remains. Uh, part of those were recovered from a wood stove at that residence. They identified that someone had come out and in a very suspicious way had left things in a dumpster there at Donna Drive. We responded and at that point in time, we were able to locate items which we knew belonged to Christy Schoenkopf. They did find uh, Christy Schoen's ID in that dumpster and uh, several other items that came from the house. Two years later, in 2017, Jason pled guilty to avoid the death penalty and was sentenced on April 27, 2017 to spend a minimum of 59 years to a maximum of 74 years in prison, which would be the rest of his life. Now, after the police found the Cod's remains, they conducted a second search on his property, where they found bits of fabric, leather, and some unknown hard fragments under a concrete fish pond. No confirmation on the fragments has been made regarding them being human. Darcel, police aren't saying anything about what they found, like whether it was human bones or if they believe they have discovered Quinn's remains. So these documents still leave us with a lot of questions. It was nearly three months ago on March 31st that Asheville police executed a search on Jason Owens' property days after he was charged with the murders of Christy and JT Todd and their unborn child. All along, Owens has been a person of interest in the disappearance of 18-year-old Zeb Quinn. It's very complex, as you've reported on. Uh, Mr. Owens was a person of interest in the, in the, the Quinn disappearance from 2000, and uh, it, those kind of things do make the case. Uh, you know, it does make the case much more complicated. Those search warrants released Monday tell us what investigators involved in Quinn's case found. Fabric, leather materials, unknown hard fragments, unknown white powder substance, metal and concrete are the listed items seized from Owen's property on that day. 
That search happened after one of Owen's unnamed relatives led police back to his property and said Owens poured concrete eight feet long and eight feet wide and claimed he was constructing a fish pond sometime after Quinn disappeared in January 2000. That individual also told police it was, quote, at a distance from the residence that would not be convenient to enjoy it from and was not completed and said Owens later covered it with fill dirt. In 2017, Jason Owens was also indicted for the first-degree murder of Zeb Quinn. People believe they have their man, and he was already in custody. He is charged with a murder that happened 17 years ago. 7 News first told you last night about the indictment against Jason Owens. Brianna Smith has new details from investigators who cracked this cold case. Yeah, Robert Jason Owens was the last known person to see Zeb Quinn alive. And just three months after Owens was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison for a double murder, he's now going to face another trial. Today, a lead investigator with the police department spoke about those recent developments. Investigators wouldn't say what the missing piece was that allowed them to present a case against Owens to the grand jury yesterday, but they did say that they were relieved to have arrest in the case. So he's been charged with the murder of Zeb Quinn, but we really have no idea what the evidence is. They must have found something because other than that, he was the last person to see him alive. He was very suspicious. He accidentally murdered a couple, apparently, but he then cut up their bodies and burnt them. So he's um pretty suspicious, to say the least. This face is not a new one to the Asheville Police Department. Robert Jason Owens has a criminal history dating back to 1999. That was his first DWI. 36-year-old Robert Jason Owens is in the news now, but you might already know him for past crimes. In 2002, he was involved in a high-speed chase with APD where he shot at officers during the chase. In that case, Asheville police say Owens was also driving drunk, leaving him with charges like reckless driving and assault on a police officer. He has uh, narcotics charges uh, and most recently uh, been charged with two counts of first degree murder and murder of an unborn child. That brings us to today, but if you go back in time even before 2002, you'll find a missing persons case in 2000 involving the disappearance of a Buncombe County teen named Zeb Quinn. Now, there are still a hell of a lot of unanswered questions in this case. Who sent Zeb a message on his pager that distressed him so much? It couldn't have been Jason, because he was with him that night. Allegedly, of course. We do have to take Jason's word on a lot of what happened. Um, and we're not sure how trustworthy he is, so... We do have security footage of Zeb in the gas station, so we know at least part of the story is true. But it doesn't seem like Jason has admitted anything regarding Zeb's disappearance, even though he's been charged with it. It's also quite a coincidence that the message Zeb received was traced back to his aunt's house, the aunt he rarely, rarely contacted, while she was out with people that didn't exactly have the best relationship with Zeb, and we know for sure that Wesley was out to probably beat his ass at least, and maybe, maybe worse. What happened to Zeb's car? Was Misty involved? What was the meaning of the lipstick drawings and the dog of all things? Someone obviously wanted it to be found by leaving a puppy inside, headlights on, cracked windows. I mean, if you're trying to be inconspicuous, doing all of those things to a car, and then leaving it in a public car park right across from where the victim's mother worked, you're doing a terrible job. So, to me, it seems like Misty, Wesley, and Jason could possibly have been in cahoots together. Now, Jason may be unwillingly. There's no known connection between Jason and Misty and Wesley. It's not believed that they actually knew each other. But it definitely seems like Jason knows a lot more about what happened to Zeb. I mean, he called in pretending to be him. So, maybe Zeb received a message on his pager uh, the message had come from his aunt's house. He raced back to the gas station, made a call. Maybe the message had a number on it, so he either called his aunt's house or somewhere else. He raced off somewhere, maybe met up with Misty and Wesley, was killed, and maybe Jason had got along with Zeb and was also beaten up, threatened, silenced. I mean, Jason had injuries. He had gone to the hospital the night Zeb disappeared, 
claiming it was a car accident, yet his car had little to no damage on it. Maybe they bet the shy out of Jason to keep his mouth shut. They drew the lipstick on the car as like a taunt because they knew Zeb was into Misty. But see, another thing is that Jason has been charged with Zeb's murder, first degree murder. So if he was keeping quiet out of fear of Misty and Wesley, he can talk now, he's in prison already. I mean, I know we're grasping at straws here, but that's really all we have to go on, unless, unless Jason decides to open his gob while in prison, but he hasn't, he has kept it zipped, so. And that's the story so far, I mean, who knows, if more will come, maybe Jason will decide to change his mind and start talking. But at the moment, that's where we are. It's a bizarre one. And finally, thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Please let me know your thoughts on this disturbing case in the usual place. And I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Thanks again, Mike out.